word of God is the mind of God. And we're going to read context in Genesis 1. He says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it, it was good. And so we've learned that, we learned, I believe, last week or the week before that when he talks about the deep, he's talking about the inside, the heart, not the face of the waters, right, the deep. And, and so as it applies to us, when God's Spirit came along the first time, when you were introduced to God, right, and you you accepted Christ, that spirit moved, and the thing that was inside of you that was dark, God said, let there be light. And that light is a good thing, right? Yes. And the way that, and the way that light enters is we learn this also, right? The light of the body is the what? Is the eye. We talked about that last week, how that... We need to make sure we don't have a veil over our eyes when we're reading the word. We don't need to have a beam in our eyes. Anything that's going to affect that light from filling our bodies, we need to make sure we get it out of our life. And so what I want to show you is that uh, the entrance of thy words give a flight. Now, what does that mean? The entrance of thy words Give a light. It it means it give a what? Right. Understanding. Understanding. <laughs> when the words enter in, that light that it says that enters in is actually understanding. And I want you to I want you to look at the definition. We all know what that means when we understand something. But sometimes it helps us to look at these these definitions. It means comprehending or apprehending the ideas or sense. Of who? Another, Another right? Uh, he says, knowing the faculty of the human mind by which it apprehends the real state of things presented to it. In other words, the truth, right? right. Um, or by which it receives or comprehends the ideas which others express and intend to communicate. It's intelligence between two or more persons agreement of agreement of minds and so when he says the entrance of thy words give of understanding he's talking about the understanding of him right yes he he's talking about the truth of things presented to your mind the ideas which god is trying to express or intends to communicate to you about himself and that's what the word of God is. The word of God is God's mind. And for you to understand or apprehend God or the truth about God or God to be able to communicate the truth about himself to you, uh, you, 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 have to, you have to read his word. Yes. You cannot say, I think God is like this. And another person says, well, I think God's like that. And another person, and you got a million different people saying, what? Well, I think God's like this. Because you believe that God's like that doesn't make God like that. Yeah. It'd be no different than if we all had a person, a stranger standing in front of us. And, you know, one of y'all said, I think he's I think this is his name. And I think he's like this. And then another person said it. And, and we could all be wrong. The only way that any of us would know that person's name or know anything about them would be to actually communicate with them, right? And let them tell us who they are. Yes. Job, he says, there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them what? In understanding. Yes. So God, God is the one that is to communicate the truth. He's the one to communicate his name. He's the one that's going to communicate what he's like. He's the one that's going to communicate uh, what he expects. He's the one that's going to communicate what's good and what's evil. Right. Because in our days, people make evil good and good evil, right? Yes. So, you know, how do we know that 
homosexuality is wrong. So some people in the world say it's all right. How do how do we know how do we know that um, you know it's all right to 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 deceive someone in a business practice and to say you know what I'll give you this amount of money and then go back on it? How do we know that that something's <laughs> wrong with that, right? Yes. In in Corinthians, Paul says, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. Now, I want you to, I want you to not, not just run over that and skim over that. I want you to look what he says. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God had prepared for them, for them that what? That love him. All people don't love God. All believers don't love God, and I'm a pro- I'll show that to you, and I'll prove that to you in a second. But God hath, what it says, reveal them unto us by what? The Spirit. Isn't that what, and isn't that what understanding is? Yes. The apprehending of the ideas or sense of what? Another. The real, the real state of things presented. The ideas which others or God express and intend to communicate. See, God hath, is going to reveal them unto us by his spirit. He says, for the spirit search of all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God, what it says, the things of God knoweth what? No man. No man. So you can't sit here and say, well, I think God's like this, and I think God's like that, and that's just not how it works. It says, the the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So guess who's got to reveal it to you? Well, if the Spirit of God, if no man knows the things of God but the Spirit of God does, then the Spirit, guess what the Spirit's got to do? He says, God hath revealed them to us by his what? By Spirit. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. For what purpose? That we might, look at that word, know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to to him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And so for us to know the things of God, he has got to give us what? Understanding, right? Yes. He's going to express to us or communicate us the truth. And how does he give us understanding? The entrance of thy words give of what? Understanding. It is within the book is God's mind. It's what he's like. He says, for who hath known, look what it says, who hath known what? The mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. And look what Paul says. But we have what? The mind of Christ. So the mind of God, the word of God, is the mind of God or the mind of Christ. And so really, what's the goal? The goal is to take the mind of God, which is in the book, and to do what? Put it in our heart. Put it in you. Because your mind is what? Your mind is corrupt. Yes. And look what he says here. And hereby, this is talking to believers, we do know that we know him. Now, there are certain types of intimacy. There are levels of intimacy. I can know your name. When I first time I ever met you, John, or you and Carlos, Matricia, or even Mike, I know you, I knew your name. I just got to, I just, I know what you look like. I just met you, right? 
And then there and then there's other levels of intimacy. I talk to you. I find out what your childhood was like. You grew up and your parents and your different stories about the things. And and then there's there's an intimacy. You become friends, right? Yes. That's what we want to do. We want to become friends with God. We want to become intimate and know him, right? Yes. But then but then there's this there's this intimacy that only a few elect can have with God. And it's not just knowing his name and it's not just having the knowledge of God. It's not just knowing all the stories. It's not, it's not having, it's not even just having deep knowledge with God. It's a knowledge that you're going to get by one thing. And it's right here. Hereby we do know him. I'm sorry. Sorry. And hereby we do know that we know him. If we do what? His commandments. There, there is no way to know the Lord intimately, and I mean intimately, unless you keep his commandments. It's one thing to know the commandments and to know what you should do. But if you don't do what he says, you will never understand that type of intimate intimacy with God. Look at this word knowledge. Because that's where that's where the word what comes from. The word no, right? Yes. It is a clear and certain perception of that which exists or of truth and fact. It is, look at the word, acquaintance with any fact or person. So when you acquaint yourself with that person, you are getting knowledge of that person. You're getting to what? Know that person. And so he says, O Lord, how great are thy works and thy what? Thy thoughts are very deep. Where where are your thoughts contained at in a human being? In your mind. In your mind. God has a mind and his thoughts are very deep. They're in the book because we know that the word of God is what? Is the mind of God. And God's thoughts are very deep. Look what else he says about God's thoughts. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. The sum is the what? The total. Yes. He says, if I should count them, the thoughts of God, right? They are more in number than the sand. That's a lot of thoughts, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. A lot, a lot of thoughts. If he's got that many thoughts and you want to know him, do you, is there any way you can spend this lifetime, this entire lifetime and get to know all of the thoughts of God? No. No. But I tell you what, you should be trying to. Yes. Because every time you understand a truth, which is a thought of God, you become more intimate. You know him better, right? Yes. He says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. But what God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. In other words, the things that... The things in my mind are not the things in your mind because my mind is not like your mind. He says, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God wants us, he wants us to put his mind and where's that mind, where's that mind found at? In his word, he wants us to take his mind and to put it into us. He wants us to have his mind. And y'all remember the story of, of Moses. God went up. I mean, God went up. Moses went up into the mount, right? Yes. He talked with God. And God took, uh, I'm sorry, Moses took God took God's thoughts 
and he wrote them on some stone, didn't he? Right. Some of God's thoughts, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that, right? The Ten Commandments. Well, God says, and he's talking about Israel specific here, but it applies to us. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws, right? My thoughts into where? Your thoughts. Their mind. And I'm going to write them in their hearts. And that that's how you take the mind of God and put it in you. And God says, I want to write them. I don't want to write them on a, I don't want to write them on a tablet of stone. I want to take my thoughts and my laws and I want to write them on your mind and on your hearts. I want them inside of you. Because I don't want, I want to replace, I want to replace your thoughts with my thoughts. And Titus, he says, unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and un unbelieving is nothing is pure. He says, even their mind and their conscience is defiled. And we know this. There are believers out there. They profess that they what? They profess that they know God. Now listen, they in, there's intimacy. There's different levels of intimacy. They may know his name, right? They've been introduced to him. They've accepted Christ as their savior. They know God, but you know what it says? In works, they what? Deny him. They deny him. And a believer, you know, and a believer will stand up and say, oh, no, 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 no. That's talking about an unbeliever. No, he's talking about believers. They say they know God, but they deny him. Now, let me, let me give you, let me, let me show you this uh, in a story. So they answered and they said unto him, Abraham is our father. I'm sorry, Abraham is our father. And Jesus saith unto them, if if you were Abraham's children, guess what you would do? The works of Abraham. You would do the works of Abraham, right? But now you're trying you're trying to kill me. A man that hath what? Told you the truth. Told you the truth. He says, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. And said they to him. We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even who? God. What did they just do? They profess that they what? They knew God. They profess that they know God. But guess what he said about them? If you were Abraham's children, you would what? Do the works. You do the works. So even though they say, oh, God is our father, guess what? In works, they do what? Deny they deny him because what were, what were they trying to do to Christ? Killing. They were trying to kill him, weren't they? Yeah. They were trying to kill somebody who was telling them the truth. It goes on in the same um, in the same uh, chapter. He says, "Jesus answered. He says, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honors me, of whom you say that he is your what." In other words, you profess, they're professing that they know God. Yet, look what, look what Christ says to them, yet you have not what? Known. known him. But guess what Jesus says? But I what? Know him. I know him. I have an intimate relationship with him. Do you know why I have an intimate relationship? Because I know his word. And I not only do I know his word, look what he says up here. Go back up here. I'll show you. And hereby we do know that we know him if we do what? Keep his commandments. commandments. So I not only have this intimate relationship where I know his word, but guess what? I also keep his commandments. And then look, and then look what he says. He says, you say he is your God, yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I, I'll be a liar just like you, right? right? But I know him, and then look what he says, and keep his what? Sayings. 
that's an intimate relationship that you can only get by doing what he tells you to do. You can sit here all you want. We know him. And how do we know that we know him? If we keep his commandments. And that's exactly what Jesus said. I keep his saying. You can sit there all you want. And you can you can say, well, um, I profess that. I, I." You can profess all you want that you know God. But if you don't do what he says, if you deny him in works, he's going to have something to say to you one day at the judgment seat. Mm. Now, I want to talk about a man who, because look what we just said. You can, let's say that you're a believer that you believed upon Jesus, so you know him, you know his name, and then you start studying the word, right? And you're hiding the word in your heart, and you're doing all of that. And you need to, because the word is the very thing. The engrafted word is what's going to change you, right? Yes. Is there any man outside of Christ who was more, had more wisdom and knowledge than Solomon? No. No. Now let's look, look, what, now look, David's getting ready to die. And look what he says to his son. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Know him. And what? Serve him. Serve him with a perfect heart. And a what? A willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. Then David goes on, Solomon, if thou seek him, he will be found. But Solomon, if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, Solomon, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and what? Do it. Do it. The Lord had chosen thee, John, and the Lord had chosen thee, love, and the Lord had chosen thee, Mike, and the Lord had chosen thee, Carlos and Patricia, to do something for him. You got work. Be strong and what? Do it. Serve him because hereby we do know that we know him intimately if we do what? Keep his commandments. It's not just a matter of knowing the knowledge, the mind of God and what's in the book. The true intimate relationship with him is doing what he tells you to do. Yes. He says here, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. And that's what we're talking about. Hiding the word in, in your heart, right? And you're changed into the, when you look into the mirror, you're changed into the same image. We've been talking about the power of the word of God for seven weeks here. How it changes you. It makes you like him. But look what he, look what he says after this. He says, receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But... Be ye what? Doers. Doers of the word and not what? Hearers only. Hearers only because if you're just a hearer, what are you doing? If you don't do it, you just hear it. You're deceiving yourself. <clears throat> because God wants an intimate relationship that can only come from you keeping his commandments. It's the only way. That's why it says, thy word have I hid in my heart. What, what's the purpose of hiding the word in your heart? That you won't sin against God. That you won't sin, that you'll do what he says. You'll keep his commandments. Because what is what is sin? It's not doing what he says, right? Disobedience. So that there's a purpose behind doing this right here, and this is it. This is it right here. Right there. We know him if we keep his commandments. The entire purpose of reading the book and to change your heart is to get that intimate relationship that can only come through obedience. In 1 Corinthians um, 
Paul speaking to the Corinthians, he says, Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, right? That's a good gift to have from God, isn't it? Yes. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, all knowledge, where are you going to find all knowledge? His word. In his word, the mind of God. And he says, even if I have all of that, all of it, and I have all faith that I could remove mountains, but I don't have charity. You know what? You know what Paul said about himself? I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned and I don't have it profits me. Nothing. Reading the word will profit you nothing. Understanding all the knowledge that God has, understanding his mind perfectly will do you absolutely no good. So I'm going to show you the entire purpose, the entire purpose behind knowing the mind of God. And remember, the mind is the word in the word. And we're taking that word, that mind of God, and we're replacing the mind, the corrupt, defiled, impure mind that we have. We're taking that mind and we want to put it in us. And I'm going to show you the, the reason that he, he, there's a purpose behind him giving you this knowledge. You know that? There's a purpose behind him getting you to, giving you all these gifts. So, Let's look at it. Jesus says, I am the way and I am the what? Truth. We, and we know we've studied this, these truths before. God is equal to what? Truth. It's equal to truth. Now look at this. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not, look at that. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. If you're a believer that doesn't love, you know what God just said? You don't know him. Because God is what? So if God is equal to the truth and God is equal to love, then the truth is equal to love. And his word is truth, right? That book is, that book is love. Look what he says. Hereby perceive we the love of God. What is, remember, perceive? Go back up here. We perceive, that means we, right here, understand. Right. Apprehend, right? right? In other words, the ideas which God expresses and intends to communicate to us. That is exactly what perceive is. We per here we uh, perceive, we understand the love of God because he laid down his life for us. We can understand the love of God. We can understand his love for us because he did what? He laid down his life for us. And guess what we ought to do? We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso, believer, have this world's good, food, clothes, money, possessions, and see if his brother have what? Need. Need. And shutteth up his bowels of compassion. You know you should help him. God's working in you. He's like, you got his word in you. He's telling you, you need to help your brother. And you shut up your bowels of compassion from him. Look what he says. How dwelleth the love of God in him? You might have the word in you. You might have the truth in you. And that should equal this right here. But now you have the opportunity to express that what? That love. And what do you do? 
you shut it up. And he says, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in what? Mm -hmm. It's nice to preach it, isn't it? Show love, love your neighbor, love your enemies, pray for them. That it's all that's nice. But he says, let us not love in word, but it, neither in tongue, but in what? Deed. In deed truth. and in truth. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, if you continue in his word. And you'll know the truth. Wait, okay, look at this. The truth is equal to what? Love. You'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You know what the truth is? The truth is love. Yes. The entire purpose of the book is to Take love, which is God, because your heart is selfish. It's worldly. It cares about you. What he's trying to do is take love and put it into your heart, put it into your mind to make you like him because God is love. Yes. That's what sets you free is when you love others more than yourself, when you don't think of yourself when you think of others first. And so guess what? The mind of God is in the book. And the mind of God or the mind of Christ is love. And that's, that's the entire point of the book. If therefore, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the spirit, if bow, if any bows and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that you be what? Like minded. Like the mind of Christ, like minded. Well, he must be talking about knowledge and doctrines and, you know, uh, he wants us to be like minded because, you know, this person believes that the, the rapture, everybody goes before the tribulation and this person believes that, there's multiple raptures, and this person doesn't believe there's no rapture at all. So being like-minded, we we can't hang around each other because we're not like-minded. That's not what he's talking about, is it? Yeah. He says that you be like-minded having the what? Same the way. same love, being of one accord. Look at that word accord. Agreement, harmony of minds. Have you ever heard have you ever seen an orchestra play? because that's what it means. It's a concert. It's a harmony of sounds, right? When he says one accord of one mind being like-minded, the same love in agreement. Look at that word agreement. Go back up here one more time and look at that definition, understanding. Look what it says right here. Agreement of what's, of what? Minds. God wants you to have his mind. He wants you to be in agreement with his mind. He wants all the believers to be in agreement with his mind. And what is his mind? His mind is love. He goes on, he says, let, here it is, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than who? Themselves. Themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now look what he, how he finishes it. Let this mind be in you, which was also where? In Christ. In Christ Jesus. What? Well, what kind of mind? Like-minded, having the same what? Love. Love. Esteeming others better than yourself, right? Not looking on your own things, but looking on the things of others. That is love. That is the mind of Christ. That is true intimacy with God. Writing to the Romans, 
He says, we then that are strong ought to, ought to do what? Bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please who? Ourselves. Ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ, the mind that you're supposed to have in you, right? For even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that are reproached thee fell on me. Christ took everybody's burden upon himself. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be, look what he says, like-minded one toward another, according to Christ Jesus, that you have one mind and one mouth, glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ also received us. When he talks about having being like-minded and having the mind of Christ and having one mind and one mouth and being in one accord. He's not talking about doctrine. It's nice that if we can and we all can come to the truth, right? But that's not going to happen right now. In part it will, but not fully. You, you have to understand when he's talking about this, He's talking about putting yourself in a lower position and lifting up other people, making them more valuable and more important than yourself. He goes on, he says, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, he says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there are be no divisions among you, Right, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. And people say, oh, see, that's 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 talking about doctrine. So if you don't have our doctrine, you need to go find another church. It's not what he's talking about. <laughs> he goes on and says, look what he says, for it have been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house called, that there are contentions among you. There shouldn't be any arguing and debating. Y'all should be loving one another. He says, be kindly affectionate in it one to another. How? With what? Brotherly love. Brotherly love. In honor, preferring not yourself, but preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, right? That's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's how you have an intimate relationship. That's how you truly know that you know the Lord. You keep his commandments, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Look what else he says. Distributing to the necessity of the what? Thanks. That's love. You got to show love. You have to be obedient to God. It's not just knowing his name. It's not just believing upon Jesus as, as your savior. It's not even knowing the whole book. The book is love. The book is his mind. And he's trying to take the mind, which is love, and put it in your mind. That was, that was the biggest problem with them all. When, remember when they asked him, remember when the, the Pharisees and them asked him, he says, um, you, know, you know, talking about the great commandment, and he said, well, love your neighbor. And he's, they, you know what they did? They said, who's my neighbor? They're trying to justify it. So he took the person that they hated the most, which was the Samaritan, and he said, that's your neighbor. Peter says, finally, be ye all of what? One mind. And he's not talking about the the doc, don't give me doctrine's important. Knowledge is important. Truth is important. But he's telling every believer when you're with each other, have one mind, having what? Compassion one of another. 
love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing. If someone rails on you, if someone does evil to you, you know what you do? You do contrary to that. You do blessing. Why? Knowing that this is what you've been called to do. And if you do it, guess what? That you should what? What's the word here? Inherit the blessings. Inherit a blessing, right? Yes. You're doing it for an inheritance. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him askew evil. Just so you know, this is what askew means. To flee, to void. Avoid evil. Run from it. Do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. If you do these things, you can you can be guaranteed that if you're being obedient, that guess what? God is looking over you. And his ears are open to your what? Your prayers. Yes. But but if you don't, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of them, of him that is which is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you. Now listen, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Why? Because if God be for us, guess what? Who can be against you? Who's going to be against us? That's, that's the intimacy that we're all seeking. It starts, yeah, it starts with believing and accepting Christ as your Savior, yes. But that's just like the first time you ever meet a new friend. I met Mike 27, 28 years ago. I met you, uh, Patricia, probably 20-something years ago, right? Yes. When I first met you, I, I knew you by name. I talked to you. I got to know you. It takes time. But ultimately, what it comes down to is the, the intimacy that we are seeking with God only comes through obedience. Now, look what he says here. He says, whosoever shall keep the whole law. Now, which law? He's talking about the Mosaic law here, right? Whosoever shall keep the whole law and offend in one point, guess what? He's guilty of all. And then he's going to give you an example. For he that said, do not commit adultery, guess what? God also said, do not kill. So if you don't commit adultery, but you kill, you, you become a transgressor of the law. So that would be like if I told my child, you know what? Um, don't go outside uh, in the rain. And then I told him also, uh, don't, don't turn on the television. And then he turns on the television and I say, what are you doing? Didn't I tell you not to do that? I didn't go out. I didn't go out in the rain. Just because you didn't do, just because you were obedient to one of the commands I gave, does that mean that you're not guilty? No. So that's what the Mosaic law did. The Mo Mosaic law showed every human being that they were guilty before God, because how many of us can keep it? Definitely. None of us can keep it. He says, look what he says about that first, that first law, that first covenant. He says, verily, the first covenant had what? Ordinances. There were ordinances, and you had to keep them all. The Jews had to keep every one of them. And then look at what he says. But what, look what he says about the ordinances. They were a figure, right? An example. They're in a shadow for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances, right? The first covenant had ordinances, 
But those ordinances in the first covenant were only imposed on them until a certain time. It's called the Reformation. That word reform, reformation, is an amendment of that which is defective. It is going to change something from worse to better. It's going to correct it, right? Yes. And that first covenant, guess what? It had some flaws in it. Because if you committed, if you didn't keep the whole thing, you were guilty. And so, so the king, our king Christ is going to come along, right? Because we're only under these ordinances until the time of, and you know what he's going to do? He's going to reform the law because that's what a king does. Look what he does here. He says, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, right? Yes. That, that, that was in the past. That's the Mosaic law. You've heard them say that thou shalt not kill and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I'm the king now. Guess what I say unto you? You know what he's doing? Reform. He's reforming the law. You're under a new law. You're not under the first covenant anymore. You're under Christ law. He says, you have heard that it was said unto them by, uh, or said to them by, uh, I'm sorry. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But guess what? I'm the king. Guess what I say? The law has been reformed. We're not under the Mosaic law. We're under the second covenant. We're under the law of Christ. And let me show you what the law of Christ says. Because under the old covenant, under the Mosaic law, you couldn't keep it. If you failed in one point, you were guilty before God. Do you know that? Yes. Now watch this. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt, what's the word? Love. love the Lord God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. It's love. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt what? Love, love thy neighbor as thyself. He says on these two commandments hang how much of the law? All, all the law. Romans, owe no man anything but to what? Love one another. For he that loveth another, what does he say? Hath fulfilled the law. All the law and the prophets hang on these two law. Love God, love your neighbor. He says, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. If there be any other commandment, do what he says, if there be any other commandment, all of them, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. You know what that word comprehended, you know, you know where that definition is? Understanding. God wants you to understand the interests of thy life, uh, the entrance of thy words giveth understanding. You're trying to comprehend what God's saying to you. And all of these, then do not commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear fault with witness, don't covet. And if there's any other commandment, all the commandments, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, guess what? Love is the fulfilling of the law. Whereas in the Mosaic law, if you did not keep the whole law, you were guilty before God. God is saying that if you will love him and if you will love your neighbor, you have done what? You fulfill the whole law. That is an intimate relationship with God because what did he say? He said, we will know that we love God, all right, or that we know God if we keep his what? And guess what? Doing these two things, loving the Lord and loving God, is keeping his commandments. It's fulfilling the whole law. 
The entire book is for the purpose of teaching you how to love like God. The entire book is to teach you how to love other people because it's hard, isn't it? People get make us angry. We get frustrated with people. We talk, we gossip, we do all these things. You know how I know that Stephen, Stephen fulfilled the whole law. Yes. Because when they were stoning him, he wasn't thinking about himself. You know what he said? He said, Lord, for, forgive them. Hold this not to their charge. Christ on, on the cross. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive them, Lord. That's love. Putting other people. No, you can know they're evil. You can, we all, the imaginations of all men are continually evil from their youth. But true charity, true charity is loving them despite their flaws. We all have our own struggles. We all have our own battle, uh, battles. But to, have a, but to have an intimate relationship with God, a truly intimate relationship that he knows you and you know him, you have to keep his commandments. You have to know how, you have to learn how to love people. So we'll, we'll close on these last couple. He says, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, do what? Not serve yourself. Serve one another. How, for all the law, how much of it? All. All the law is fulfilled in one word. Look how he put it up here. He says, and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. All these commandments are all put together and said, you're fulfilling all of them if you will love your neighbor as yourself, right? That's the fulfilling of the law. And he says the same thing, thing here. All the law was fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. No man's ever hated his own flesh. He says, if you love your neighbor like you love yourself, <clears throat> you fulfill the law. Because that is how you know God intimately. And if you don't, if you don't get, listen, it's a narrow path into the kingdom. A very narrow path to get into the kingdom. This is what is required. Because if you know how to do this, you know God and he knows you. Look what he says here. He said, and we'll close. Here's the judgment seat. Every believer's got up here, right? To receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad, right? Yes. And not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord's going to enter into the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father. So many will say to me in that day, Lord, the what he says, have we not? I mean, Lord, I, I taught prophecy. Lord, I gave to the poor. Lord, I did this. I Lord, I did that. Have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name we've done many wonderful works. We've done all this. You know what he's going to say to them? Mm -hmm. I never knew you. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Put yourself, you need to become the servant of all men. Well, who's my neighbor? Pick the person in the world that you hate the most. Pick your enemy. And if he's hungry, you know what you need to do? Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. All right.